arson was one of the primary forms of resistance because it was hard to track. Poisoning was another. Running away was another because you were literally stealing property from the master if you ran away. A runaway ad in 1746 describes 16-year-old Stephen Thusley. He has been much whipped, which is back with show. Another ad describes Peter as Virginia-born, running away with iron shackles on his legs. Day after day, slaves are refusing to obey. They are saying, listen, we have our own lives. We will not go that far. We will not submit totally. Slave and master knew each other well. Using this familiarity, slaves constantly tested the boundaries. They negotiated with their masters for more time to work on their own gardens or to sell and trade produce they cultivated. It would seem that the somebody who's a slave would have no power and had, would have nothing to negotiate. But slaves found that they could negotiate. They danced the dance of domination and subordination. One of the most profound forms of resistance was the preservation of African religions, values, and beliefs. What it did is create an internal universe which is separate and apart from and beyond the control of a white master. Yet, something else was emerging. The first generation of American-born descendants of Africans are really in the process of creating something that has a very strong link to Africa, but which is really quite new. On plantations, new African arrivals mixed with American-born slaves to shape a new culture. The Jefferson family may have a violin from Europe, you know, and someone plays that fiddle. Jupiter's family from Africa knows how to make banjos. In fact, Thomas Jefferson himself writes about how the banjo is an African instrument. Originally in Africa, they often made it using a big gourd. So this, this complicated coming together of different cultures, not just Europe and Africa, but varieties of West African cultures. On any given plantation, any given young person like Jupiter is experiencing all these forces. For Jupiter, growing to adulthood, it was a double life. When Jefferson went off to college in Williamsburg, Jupiter accompanied him as his valet. When Jefferson went to court his future wife at her father's plantation, Jupiter would find his future wife enslaved there. They would all end up at Monticello, Jefferson's mansion in rural Virginia. As slaves began forming extended families, the slave quarter became the center of family life. They, like any other human beings, free or unfree, um, a thousand years ago or today, uh, have the emotions of any other people. They fall in love, they hate others, they develop friendships. And how to do this within the milieu of slavery simply made those very human realities more difficult and more challenging, but they existed. Networks of love and affection and connection between the enslaved have got to be um, really crucial to surviving the experience of slavery, to surviving it on an emotional level as well as a physical level. But in the creation of those families, it gave their owners yet another weapon to force them 
to behave in the ways that they wanted. What this community then becomes is the foundation for an internal slave trade where these children and these families will be separated in the future. It's almost unimaginable the tragedy of seeing next of kin simply removed, disappeared, shipped somewhere else. The sheer mind-boggling, excruciating situation of dealing with arbitrary power on a daily basis, not knowing when you wake up in the morning whether the family will be complete when you go to bed at night. at the runaway advertisements in the colonial newspapers, what's striking is that roughly half of the people are running away to see kinfolk, to see loved ones. Slave sales and cross-plantation marriages meant that families were strewn across the landscape. A web of well-worn footpaths soon connected plantations and farms creating a kinship map of a region. Those paths also functioned as trading and news networks. The complex waterways of the Atlantic seaboard extended these contacts. They would become key for a young slave named Titus, coming of age on the eve of the American Revolution. During the early 1770s in Monmouth County, New Jersey, Titus worked alongside his quick-tempered owner, John Coyles. It was a time when some colonists were beginning to protest British restrictions on their freedom. Titus was alert to the gathering storm. He knew that one Protestant group, the Quakers, had begun to free their slaves. John Corley's was a Quaker. When Titus turns 21, he knows this is the age in which other Quakers are freeing their, their, their enslaved people. Corley's refuses to do so. Unlike other Quakers, Corley's also refused to teach Titus to read and write. But he did send his young slave to market alone. Titus would take advantage of this practical education he had a wide range of survival skills. He earned cash by selling animal skins and produce he had grown. He also owned a metal map of the area and its extensive waterways. As Titus turned 21, it was 1775. The American Revolution had begun. He now saw the mounting political conflict as an opportunity. He made a dangerous and risky move. When Titus ran, some half million, or one in five people in the colonies, were of African descent. Most were enslaved. Some were free. A few even owned slaves themselves. As the relationship between the colonists and the British deteriorated, black people in America faced a new challenge. How to make their demands for freedom heard in the growing cacophony for liberty. In rural Massachusetts, a domestic slave by the name of Mom Bet was paying close attention to this unfolding crisis. She worked alongside her sister, Lizzie, in the home of John and Hannah Ashley. Colonel John Ashley was probably the most important man in town. The Ashleys owned just about everything there was to own, including, as it turned out, Mumbet herself. One day, an incident occurred that would strengthen Mumbet's resolve. Lizzie was making for herself some wheat cakes from the scraps that were left over, and Mumbet is watching from the other side of the room. When Mrs. Ashley sees this and gets furious. She 
she takes a, a coal pan from the fireplace, a red-hot device that she's ready to bring down uh, on little Lizzie's head. Well, Mum Bet, of course, would never sit for that. gets the uh, uh, coal pan on her own forearm and it burns her severely and leaves a nasty scar. Well, for years afterwards, uh, Mumbet made a point of rolling up her sleeves whenever she was in public so that she would reveal the scar. So that when people would ask her, why, Betty, what happened? She would say, ask madam. Mumbet would soon take her destiny into her own hands. Deprived of an opportunity to learn how to read and write, Mumbet was listening in on the growing resentment of the colonists.